Hello, I'm Yuan Yuan, and you are watching Buckingham News, our top stories. The University of Buckingham adopts another dog to join the student Wi-Fi team helping stress out students. With the town's population booming, the Citizen Advice Bureau is calling out for more volunteers. And it's time to cook down that bacon sandwich as we celebrate World Vegetarian Day. Increasing demand on the Citizen Advice Bureau in Buckingham has led to a drive for additional volunteers. With more people living in Buckingham than ever before, we sent over hills to investigate how the service supports local residents. In times gone by, the generations of families that all grew up together in Buckingham could provide each other with familial support when times were tough. Now, with more new build properties springing up in town all the time, attracting people from all over the country who do not have that close family support network readily available, the ever-increasing population instead turned to the Citizens Advice Bureau for advice and support. But the demand on the service is such that they simply cannot cater to it at present without expanding their team of volunteer helpers. Why do you think there has been such an increase in the demand? The government has recently changed a certain type of benefit for disability people. The equivalent period last year, I think we were doing something like 20, 25 a month. Uh, the equivalent last quarter, we did 108. A simple mathematics says that's about a 30% increase. So what is it that you're hoping volunteers can help with? A lot of time that our volunteers are, are interviewing clients to find out what the root cause of the problem is. We've got a really good um, computerised information system here. The volunteers don't necessarily have to have it all up here in their head. What they do need to do is be able to interrogate our system and then put it across in layman's terms. Uh, to local residents so that they can go away armed with all the facts and figures that they need. The Citizens Advice Bureau here in Buckingham currently employs between 25 and 30 volunteers. So if you're interested in joining and supporting the team, have a look on their website or give them a call for more information. This is Owen Hughes for Buckingham News. Vice-Chancellor Sir Anthony Seldon hosted a fireside talk on the world of nanotechnology by Professor Jeremy Ramston. Sherry Tan reports. Professor Jeremy Ramsden is a specialist in nanotechnology with various degrees in natural sciences from Cambridge and a doctorate in chemical physics of which he was appointed honorary professor at the University of Buckingham in 2012. Nanotechnology is a field with exponential innovation where every new discovery can solve problems and create solutions across many different sectors. During the talk, How Small is Small, Professor Ramsden covered topics such as the history of technology and engineering, as well as the part it plays in nanotechnology and the future developments in the field. Nanotechnology is engineering with atomic uh, scale precision. It allows you to look at anything, really. Molecular biology is really, you could call it nanobiology. The talk was well attended with audiences filling the room. Among questions raised, the ones regarding the history of technology and engineering led to a good discussion. How small is small? The talk has opened up a whole new world. It is smaller than the eye can see, but might be a bigger topic for our and future generations to explore. This is Shawain Tan, reporting for Buckingham News. According to The Guardian, the number of university students seeking mental health help has increased by 50% in five years. With fresher starting at university across the country in the last few weeks, Henry Thompson has been to find out more. As tens of thousands of teenagers have departed for university in the past few weeks, counselling services on campus are feeling the strain. Many services who deal with mental health say they are under-resourced and are struggling to deal with large influxes of students. Students can arrive to university and immediately feel pressured to achieve the highest possible grade, whilst at the same time trying to afford the rising costs of student fees and accommodation prices. Despite the sharp increase in students needing counselling, experts in the sector say that part of the increase can be attributed to a willingness amongst young people to ask for help. Many universities have not shied away from the demand and are proactively reaching out to help all students. In a statement, the University of Buckingham Student Welfare said, It is easier for lecturers and students to be able to discuss these issues and for students to come forward and admit they are struggling rather than have to suffer in silence. The Big White Wall is one of the many resources available at the university which helps students with their issues in a secure and completely anonymous manner. Basically just student welfare and 
it's just um, the only thing I think we need to right now is to create more awareness because most people that are faced with mental health issues are usually like they have problems with sharing their problems with like people like they get shy and stigmas and all of that so it's just to create more awareness for students to be able to share their problems with the student welfare to be able to deal with them because if they're not able to share their problems the student welfare won't be able to deal with them. Whilst the upside to this increase is that students are now more comfortable looking for help with their problems, universities need to take a step back and consider if they are doing everything that can be done to help with these counselling needs. This is Henry Thompson for Buckingham News. After the arrival of the first official university dog, Tan Long Mili, last term, the University of Buckingham now welcomes a second poach, taken in from a local family who could no longer care for her. Alisa Lee has been to meet Darcy, Mili's new K-9 colleague. Tano Milley, who came to the university in July, was warmly welcomed by students, many of whom came up to visit the puppy. Due to the huge demand for Milley, which was deemed too much for the four-and-a-half-month-old puppy to cope with alone, a second university dog, Darcy, has joined the family. Darcy was rescued by the head of student welfare, Di Bangta, a month ago, after a local family was no longer able to care for her. Little Darcy is also a cockapoo, and she's a month older than Tano Milly. Many of the students that come in here how, are suffering from emotional health problems and um, depression, mental health issues. Um, their reaction when they come in, they, they melt really with this, the dogs. They get on the floor, they play with them, they take them out for walks. Uh, it improves their mental health, they stroke them, they cuddle them and they go out feeling a lot calmer and a lot happier. The dog lovers, it's a good opportunity to go out and cuddle the puppy or play with the dog to distract themselves and then go back to their like daily life. I think it's a great idea that the university keeps a pet, actually two, um, to favour student mental health. And having more pets I think is uh, good for, beneficial for those students who need a sort of other way to sort of chill and relax after a hard day's work. Buckingham is not the only university to use dogs to help stress out students. In order to aid relaxation and calmness, with the universities of Bristol, Nottingham and Aberdeen also using similar schemes. Darcy was a little bit shyer than Millie to begin with, but now she has met so many people and she's more open and loving, and loves coming to work. This is Alisa Lee, Buckingham News. The law school held their annual debate by the Dr. James Leiter defending jurisprudence and Dr. Sarah Sargent arguing for human rights, where the Elegant reports on the compelling debate. The Radcliffe Centre was host to the annual law school debate, where the two teams argued over the statement, This house believes that any functioning legal system must dislocate law for morality. The jurisprudence team argued in favour of the statement, stating that morals should be dislocated from law. The basis of their argument was rooted in the idea that morals are individual and thus cannot be implicated in lawmaking. I think that our arguments are technical and cold and the arguments of our opponents are warm and, and human, and that always, in a debate such as this, that often wins, wins the day. The human rights team disagreed and stated that morals are implicitly linked with law and argued that without a moral framework, we will not know right from wrong. I think the question about the subjectivity of morality is a difficult one, and that's a hard question to actually come up with a definitive answer as to whose morality is the right morality. While a majority of the statements and questions made by the audience were in support of jurisprudence, the Human Rights Team were declared the victors. The Human Rights Team has won three out of the last four annual debates, so hopefully jurisprudence will be able to turn the tide at next year's. This is Velda Algon, reporting for Buckingham News. This summer's vote to leave the European Union has led some UK-based European employees to rethink their future in the country. A leading German academic body has warned the government about maintaining the freedom of movement for EU academics. Elviano Yosoputra has more on the story. After June 23 Brexit result, the UK government are expected to give free movement for EU academics or a risk of losing up to 15% of staff in British universities. Margaret Wintermantel, head of the Academic Exchange Service in Germany, said that the uncertainty about future working and residence condition is rather proving painful to top academics to turn down British university jobs. I'm not sure we can talk about post-Brexit because Brexit hasn't happened yet. Um, we shouldn't forget that this country is still in the European Union at the minute, that Article 50 hasn't been triggered yet, even though the Prime Minister has just announced she will do so 
uh, by the end of March next year. And we all know that after that we will have a long process of negotiations and that could take years. A report from the pro-Remain group Scientists for the EU showed that numerous cases had appeared in the country, ranging from EU nationals turning down UK jobs to some stopping work and even leave, leave the country. In addition to this, the groups also received a report citing xenophobia as a concern with people experience verbal abuse after the Brexit vote. Would I feel isolated after Brexit? Again, I would say hopefully not, in the sense that universities are supposed to be places that look outwards. British universities collaborate and work with other universities, businesses, organizations around the world. While national academies and universities have urged the government to guarantee that existing EU staff will be able to remain after Brexit, the government has yet to state anything regarding the issue. Thus, we can only wait for the decision to come out. This is Alfie Anuya Saputra, Buckingham News. If you ever needed an excuse to go to the cinema, here it is. According to a new study from Oxford University, watching films makes us happier and helps us handle physical pain. Carrie Eogui has a story. Professors at Oxford University recently published a study revealing that watching films that trigger an emotional response increases our pain threshold and social bonding. The study states that watching emotionally arousing films releases endorphins, the happy chemical and cause of the runner's high that makes us bond with those we share the cinematic experience with. Dramas seem to be the genre that causes the emotional reaction most intensely, but any film that causes laughter or tears share the same result. The most surprising finding in the study is that the release of endorphins following the film causes a significant increase in our tolerance for pain. Most people aged 18 to 25 spend at least two hours every day watching television or films in their spare time. So we ask students at the university who they watch films with and how it makes them feel. I usually watch films alone, but if you want to watch films with friends or something, I watch it with friends. I don't know. Um, I like movies because they're quite relaxing um, and you can watch them with friends or by yourself um, and it's quite nice to have some downtime. Um, when I watch it with my friends, like, it's, it's more fun obviously and like, it, it, yeah, it brings us closer, like, we talk about it and like, clear about it and stuff. So, yeah. so while exercise and a healthy diet are very important in maintaining good mental health, it seems as though that weekend excursion to the cinema can be considered as part of a healthy lifestyle. This is Karen Yogre reporting for Buckingham News. In other news, this year the University of Buckingham has earned the first place ranking for teaching quality in the Times and the Sunday Times Good University Guide. Buckingham has also been ranked first for staff students with shield and cost satisfaction by the Complete University Guide 2017, as well as coming top for graduate employability, according to the Higher Education Statistics Urgency 2016. The University of Buckingham has been invited to participate in the next series of University Challenge. BBC Two's flagship show quiz students on academic subjects and involves university collecting together their most intelligent students and going head-to-head -head against another university. The student unit is hosting a mini-challenge, which will see the winners represent the university on the program. After beginning life in American in 2014, International Broadcast Day made its way to this short last Friday. The event is dedicated to promoting broadcasting worldwide through education and public engagement. Scott Sandley has more. If you've ever used iTunes Store or accessed BBC iPlayer to listen to the radio, it's quite likely that you've seen a tab called Podcasts. International Podcast Day, celebrated on the 30th of September, is an annual event that aims to get podcasters together to help raise awareness for this relatively new media. Around 3.2 million people in the United Kingdom download podcasts according to a study by the Radio Joint Audience Research, but only 62% of the episodes they download are ever listened to. The term podcast, first derived from a portmanteau of the words iPod and broadcast back in 2005, is simply a digital audio file, much like a radio show or an audiobook, that you can download and listen to on the go. We have a live stream that goes around the world. It takes uh, 33 hours. This year, we have 16 different countries and speaking in their own native languages. But the ultimate goal is honestly to say, here's a day that we can all come together and celebrate this thing we love called podcasting. Anybody can record and release their own podcast. So why not grab your own microphone, press the record button, and join in this phenomenon in time for next year's International Podcast Day. This is Scott Stanley for Buckingham News.
And now over to sport with Catherine Chalice. Thank you, Yuan. A Buckingham Charity Cup football match last week saw the University of Buckingham take on Oxfordshire's Middleton Cheney FC at the local Buckingham Athletic Football Ground. Tamalo Teo Oyatibo was there to catch all the action. The Charity Cup game was held to raise money for two charities, each championed by the competing teams. The further each club goes in the tournament, the more money is raised for the chosen organisation, with the University of Buckingham playing for the medical detection dog charity. The game started slow, with the first goal not being scored until the second half of the match, when Middleton Cheney took the lead. After an indifferent first half in which neither side got the better of the other, Middleton Cheney surprised everyone by dominating Buckingham in the second period, drumming to a decisive six-goal win. The match ended 6-0 to Middleton Cheney, who go on to the quarterfinals. While this is the end of the road for the University of Buckingham, who are now knocked out of the cup. The university's run in the tournament may have ended. Hopefully, they'll be able to better their run and make even more money next time. This is Tamla Retiratable for Buckingham News. Following the announcement of the partnership between the university and MK Dons, two students have begun working with the club. Mina Omagomi has the story. In August, MK Dons Football Club announced their first university partner, the University of Buckingham. Now, two students from the university have begun working with them. Paul Rutland and Owen Hughes began working for the MK Dons Football Club last week Tuesday. At present, they film warm-ups and half-time events for Periscope and Facebook Live. The two students are filming the half-time crossbar challenge for Progress Suzuki, the sponsor of the football club. In addition to this, they will be filming pre-game and half-time events for MK Dons. That element of partnership has a lot of room to grow as well, um, potentially with kind of more opportunities for our journalism students to, to do bits of work with the club. The partnership between the university and the football club will give students opportunities to help in enhancing the performance of the club. Additionally, students will be able to enhance their own understanding through special student placements at Stadium MK, made available to students at the University of Buckingham. It's been really good so far. We've, been, we've had access to all areas, which has been amazing. We can get all over the place, film basically whatever we want. And uh, so it's a really good insight into not just how they work, but also how a match day here works, which hopefully the fans will like when we produce the final piece. Although there are only two students currently involved, there will be opportunities further down the line for other students to get involved. This is me, Norma Gomi, Buckingham News. That's it for the Sports Roundup this week. Back to UN in the studio. Last Saturday saw people all around the country think twice before tucking into their bacon sandwich for breakfast at the 1st October marked World Vegetarian Day. Jason Dunn got to the meat and bones of this story to find out what the annual event is all about. Would you consider swapping the meat in your burger for a grilled aubergine if you thought that it would be healthier and more environmentally friendly? That's what the International Vegetarian Union have suggested meat eat ever since they first began endorsing World Vegetarian Day back in 1978. The Vegetarian Society said that national events like Vegetarian Day are about celebrating food, stories and traditions. Being a vegetarian is a choice that is kinder to animals, to people and to our living planet. The United Nations have urged a global shift to a meat and dairy free diet highlighting environmental degradation. Meat and dairy production currently accounts for 70% of fresh water consumption and 38% of land use and 19% of greenhouse emissions. We asked some University of Buckingham students if they could go a day without eating meat. If you eat a meal without meat, it's almost like you're suffering. So yeah, I, would, I don't think I can ever go a day without meat. I mean, meat is in my diet. I grow up eating meat every day. Meat is, very is a very important part of my meal. I cannot eat like a meal without meat. Uh, bacon in the morning, chicken every day pretty much, so I can't actually see a, a substitute that I could have reliably every day without getting bored of it quickly. A recent poll suggests that 6% of the UK's population is vegetarian or vegan and is increasingly becoming a popular culture. This is Jason Dunn for Buckingham News. October 1st was International Coffee Day, an event launched in Milan last year to promote fair trade coffee and to raise awareness of the plight of coffee growth around the world. We sent Philip Jones to make a delicious tilamisu to celebrate this special day. 
Tiramisu is a popular Italian dessert flavoured with coffee. This version uses sponge fingers soaked in espresso topped with a light, airy mascarpone cream. For this recipe you will need a pot of double cream, a tub of mascarpone, five tablespoons of caster sugar, a pot of strong coffee, a packet of sponge fingers, some dark chocolate, and cocoa powder. Start by making your coffee. Then whip the cream and mascarpone together until thick and light. Then mix the sugar into the cream. Pour the coffee into a shallow dish and soak the sponge fingers in the coffee for a few seconds. Cover the bottom of a dish with the fingers and then top with some of the cream mixture. Repeat until all the sponge and the cream is used up. Grate the chocolate over the tiramisu and chill for a few hours or overnight until firm and set. Dust with cocoa powder and serve. This tiramisu is the perfect way to end any dinner. Part cake, part dessert, all delicious. This is Philip Joss for Buckingham News. Thank you for watching Buckingham News. We'll see you next week.